Welcome, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Tunha Lee. I serve as the Executive for Economic and Environmental Justice at United Methodist Women, which is now called United Women in Faith. So for those of who you who are not aware, United Methodist Women has recently changed its name so that we more authentically reflect the diversity of our members, even if our local church may be be headed in a different direction, or even if we ourselves may not be United Methodist. I actually became a United Methodist Women member before becoming a United Methodist. And during our 153 year history, we have had over 25 names. Uh, and this new name, United Women in Faith, is part of a refreshment of our organization that includes a new look, new feel, and new and improved programming designed to better nurture current members and welcome new women into our sisterhood to put their love into action. Uh, just to let you know, we remain the official women's organization of the UMC and remain the training of women for leadership, growing spiritually, transforming through education and providing opportunities for service and advocacy. We remain women in mission who follow God's call for our lives and our social justice priorities of climate justice and ending mass incarceration of communities of color remain the same. And so does our Just Energy for All campaign. So it's great to be here with you all on, the, on this journey. And you could learn more about United Women in Faith by going to our new website, www.uwfaith.org. So it's a lot faster now. So uh, some information, just if you're wondering, if you're in the white right webinar. Uh, so, so to start us off, uh, Grace Han will be leading us in prayer. Grace is a Christian educator and an artist of sacred arts in pottery and quilt, and is currently serving at the Wilshire United Methodist Church as director of children's ministry. She studied at the Claremont School of Theology and earned both her master's degree of Christian education and the doctor doctorate of ministry there as well. So uh, Grace, thank you so much for leading us in prayer. She is also United Women in Faith Social Action Coordinator at the California, pa uh, California Pacific Conference. Thank you, Grace. Let us pray. God of order and creation, God of mercy and justice, God of compassion and saving love, we gathered here to learn, to study, and to live faith in action about just energy for all. Thank you for the opportunity and calling us monthly here to learn and live out as good stewards of the earth, your creation, and the world that you so loved. Now we are facing inconvenient truth that we human have been doing more harm than good to your creation and we are compelled to find ways to recover and care for the earth and new ways to live by. Our session for the month of March will be focused on corporate engagement and shareholder advocacy. Dear God, bless those who lead us, who prepare this event and who yearn to learn today. Transform us to good shepherds of your creation. Transform this planet as we strive to find ways to recover it, transform leaders of corporates, policymakers, and national leaders to feel the urgency of your call to action for this world. We have been the cause of all damages to this planet, and now we are in solution together, O oh God. Bless our learning today and bless us that we do not become weary in this long process of healing. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who is with us in this pain and healing. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Grace. Want to go over our agenda for today. Again, with prayer, I'll do a little bit of framing. We'll hear from Sarah Augustine on the current nature of reality and corporate engagement through an Indigenous perspective. And I'll provide some theological ground, grounding in United Methodist Women and Faith's connection in our work. We'll hear from Misha Guy around the importance and impact of corporate and investor advocacy. Christina Corburn Herman from ICCR will speak of the shareholder engagement and proxy voting. And we'll have time for some Q&A. 
followed by some next steps. So that's our time today. And I hope uh, you'll join me in diving in and ultimately we'll end with prayer as well. Uh, so we have a dynamic group of speakers from diverse perspectives and voices. And here's some of the faces here. And I wanted to actually begin today's session recognizing that we had a recent report that came out at the end of February by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, it's their sixth report where it noted that the planet actually, by scientists, climate scientists have noted that it's actually warmed more than uh, imagined and thought and assessed and projected. And it's at 1.1 Celsius, which is two degrees Fahrenheit. It's warming faster than had been expected and that we are at greater threat. It noted that many of us have uh, already seen and many reports have shown that women and girls are disproportionately impacted. The report also noted that the magnitude and rate of climate change and associated risk depend strongly on near-term mitigation, right? Efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation actions, right? To protect us from severe climate impacts. And that projected adverse impacts and related losses and damages escalate with every increment of global warming. So what does that mean? Heat stress will go up. Exposure to heat waves will continue to increase with additional warming. Water scarcity at two degrees Celsius relying on snow melt could experience 20% decline in water availability for agriculture after 2050. Food security is a threat. Um, and flood risk, about a billion people in low-lying cities by the sea and on small islands are at risk from sea level rise by mid-century. So this is the reality that we see, scientists have been saying, and what an opportunity that we have then as people of faith to engage. One of the things I did want to note as we go in to this discussion is recognizing that a lot has happened um, and that many of us may be coming into today's session with deep pain and anguish especially for women around the world with Russia's violation of human rights and state sovereignty. Innocent women and children are dying and forced to flee from Ukraine, their homes, um, with the lack of investments in renewable energy infrastructure, grid modernization, and transition to clean energy or weatherization. Energy prices are soaring where families are deciding between another gallon of gas to go to work or take their children to school or medication. Right? It shouldn't be an either or situation. Energy burden, energy insecurity, energy poverty is on the rise. And I also recognize that today marks the one year um, since six women of Asian descent and two others were murdered because of the hate and vitriol and scapegoating of AAPI women. So I wanna be honest with you uh, that I come to this space heavy Hearted, um, and yet determined that we have a call as people of faith and as women of faith, uh, uh, that as a community, uh, we come to build a new vision and to support one another. I heard of a recent Asian American multiracial punk band of teens called Linda Lindas. <laughs> they were reviewed by the New York Times. And when one of the girls was met with sexism and racism by one of her classmates, uh, they, the band actually responded by creating a song and one of the lyrics, one of the lines in the lyrics says, we build what you destroy. So I'm grateful that together that we are building what, where the earth is being destroyed, where communities are being destroyed, but we rebuild as women of faith because God calls us into this work. And what a powerful space that an opportunity that we have then. So just wanted to note that. We know that in 2021 alone in the United States, the cost of climate and weather emergencies was $145 billion in damage. We've had last year 20 disasters that were over $1 billion or more. And by 2030, the cost of climate disaster, the cost of climate disasters and disruptions in the US could amount to 20. $240 billion per year. And some have estimated that it's like having a COVID style economic shock 
once every five years. It is climate crisis is an injustice multiplier, disproportionately impacting women and girls. And even in that, girls and women are not treated all the same by the climate crisis, right? Those who are already suffering from economic insecurity, uh, patriarchy, access issues around food, sustainability, gender injustice, and gender-based violence. And women, especially from those countries least responsible, are being most impacted. So we have a responsibility to uh, respond. The International Energy Agency estimates that to reach net zero emissions by 2050, annual climate energy investments worldwide will need to more than triple by 2030 to around $4 trillion per year. Clean energy and sustainable investment opportunities dominate energy markets. In 2021, more than $370 billion uh, was invested in renewable energy, electricity, storage, grid, and efficiency. Um, and the interesting thing is that two, 370 billion sounds like a lot, but it's actually only a little more than 9% of the 4 trillion needed to reach net zero on an annual basis, right? So investments need to go higher. And so one of the questions is, what is the role of companies in this process? And what is the role that we as people of faith can be part of in pressuring companies to increase their investment and perhaps move away drastically to away from fossil fuels and other high um, greenhouse gas emitting activities to renewables and really get us to beyond net zero. According to a carbon majors report by CDP in 2017, just 100 companies are the source of 70% of world's climate pollution. So what does that mean in terms of pressurizing particular companies in doing this work as well? I also want to note that this work, you know, as United Women of Faith, we do this with others in partnership and really hearing from frontline, most impacted communities around the world and in the United States. Uh, so what we're going to do now is transition to hear from Sarah Augustine. And Sarah Augustine uh, has engaged with and resourced United Women in Faith for many years. She is the co-founder and co-chair of the Dismantling of Doctrine of Discovery Coalition and executive director of the Dispute Resolution Center of Yakima and Kittitas counties. She's a Pueblo descendant who has written from, uh, for numerous publications and academic journals. She's a sociologist by training. She's also the author of The Land is Not Empty, Following Jesus in Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery. And um, Sarah couldn't be with us, so we have a recording, uh, but she will be joining us for the Q&A. And because it's a recording, I wanna invite all of us to turn off our video camera, so just that it'll be easier for you to see and also to make sure that you are mute um, when she is sharing. Uh, so we're grateful to have Sarah really to begin our conversation today. Hi, my name is Sarah Augustine. I'm a descendant of the Tewa people and a displaced person. I co-founded the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition, an Anabaptist movement and community of faith that seeks to dismantle systems of oppression and colonization. I'm reaching out to you today from the homeland of the Confederated Bands and Tribes of the Yakima Nation, the Yakima Indian Reservation in Central Washington State, where I live with my family. I wanna to begin today by talking about the doctrine of discovery. What is the doctrine of discovery? It's a legal and philosophical framework dating to the 15th century that gave Christian governments moral and legal rights to seize indigenous lands and dominate indigenous peoples. The patterns of oppression that continue to dispossess indigenous peoples of their lands today are found in our legal system. The doctrine of discovery is a legal doctrine that is the basis of land tenure in the United States and around the globe. It was affirmed by the US Supreme Court ruling as recently as 2005. It is also embedded in numerous historical documents such as papal bulls and royal charters. Collectively, these and other concepts form a paradigm 
of domination that legitimates extractive industries that displace and destroy many indigenous peoples and other vulnerable communities, as well as to harm the earth. I want to share with you today a vision of reality that I've learned from my elders. I've learned that we live in a closed system of mutual dependence. And this is a view of reality that's really different from the, what I've learned in the dominant culture. In this view of reality, there's no opportunity for us in our world to have access to new air or new water or new soils. We are in a world that is closed to bringing in these new vital systems of life. And our inability to preserve these systems of life has an impact on all life. That is to say that we live in a closed system of mutual dependence where every action impacts every other person and form of life within the system. This feels like a really different way of seeing the world than the way that I've learned about it through the dominant culture. I've learned from the dominant culture that progress is linear in time and is evidenced by accumulation. So in this view of reality, the earth is a set of raw resources to extract in service to progress and success is actually the accumulation of, the, of wealth, power, and security. What I've learned from my elders is that the world, the earth, is not a set of resources of commodities, but systems, life support systems that are vital and that we depend on for life. If you're looking at it in this uh, model of perpetual growth, which is put forward, this, this model that talks about progress in the dominant culture, in that model, extraction is rooted in the concept of dominion or domination. And it's justified in the concept of perpetual growth. Extraction threatens every system of life on the earth through the pollution of air, water, and soil. So there are solutions that are put forward to deal with the climate crisis, what we call the climate crisis. And these are technological solutions. This idea that we can invent our way out of the situation that we're in. But technological solutions alone will not heal creation and climate change or dismantle oppressive systems. Many renewable energy industries continue to follow extractive logic that is aimed at maintaining our lifestyle the way we have it now, and accumulation and perpetual growth are still the desired outcomes. In the vision of the dominant culture, competition is required to get one's needs met. And this leads to stratification into violent hierarchies and oppression. To dismantle the doctrine of discovery, we have to be grounded in the mandate of Jesus, uh, the, the mandate that Jesus claims in Luke, a mandate of right relationship and repair. Jesus cries out for freedom for prisoners, sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free. And he calls for Jubilee, a just reorganization of human systems. Within our work as Anabaptists, we affirm shalom or peace evidenced in creation itself and God's call to live in shalom or right relationship with creation and with each other. We affirm decolonization as a concrete way of expressing solidarity with indigenous peoples and to resist the colonial norms of perpetual growth, accumulation, and extractive logic. Decolonization is climate justice, and climate justice is decolonization. Our faith calls us to be witnesses of peace, and our commitment to living simply provides concrete actions for resisting the norms of perpetual growth, accumulation, and extractive logic. Decolonization is not a symbolic act. It is not a metaphor. Decolonization means relinquishing control of a subjugated people. 
Indigenous peoples. It means to identify, challenge, and revise or replace assumptions, ideas, values, and practices that reflect a colonizer's dominating influence. This means affirming sovereignty, the sovereignty of Indigenous peoples, and struggling with Indigenous peoples for their sovereignty. It also requires land return, returning traditional lands to Indigenous peoples, and challenging the notion of private property. Jubilee requires a complete reorientation of property, which we affirm. We affirm that to work to seek environmental justice and dismantle the doctrine of discovery is multi-generational work. And we seek to engage in a hundred year vision to dismantle the doctrine of discovery and to seek climate justice. We live and work together in community. This work is generative and collective. It is a movement. We are attracted and motivated by conviction of faith our response to Jesus' mandate, and our dedication to the earth to which we belong. We are persistent because we are committed to each other, to relationship to one another, guided and nurtured by the spirit of life who animates us. We work collectively, individually, interpersonally, and at the systems level. This vision challenges us, it nurtures us, and it connects us to each other and to all of life. We seek to embody Jubilee, right relationship, and the creator's upside down kingdom. This work is generative and it is good news indeed. I want to talk for a moment about sovereignty. What is sovereignty? Tribal sovereignty is the right of indigenous peoples to self determination. Sovereign nations have the right to form their own government, determine membership or citizenship, to make and enforce laws, to regulate trade within their borders, and to form alliances with other nations. Sovereignty is the internationally recognized right of a nation to govern itself, and, Ameri and American Indian tribes existed as sovereign governments long before Europeans settled in the Americas. A tribal government derives its sovereign power from the people and from its connection to ancestral territory. Tribal sovereignty is not a gift bestowed by an external government and is not outlined in the US Constitution, although the sovereign status of tribes is recognized by the US government and has been upheld by the US Supreme Court. Tribal sovereignty is violated again and again by extractive processes especially for energy, such as in the areas across the country where pipelines are installed on and across indigenous lands, and for minerals, such as in the Apache lands at Oak Flat, where the US government has concessed Apache ceremonial grounds to Rio Tinto for a copper mine. Standing together with indigenous peoples for decolonization is standing up for climate justice, decolonization and climate justice are one and the same. Like you, our coalition is working to disentangle ourselves from participation in systems of death that put profit above protecting the systems of life we depend on. I want to describe to you how we are attempting this work. Many of us have investments in 401k retirement plans and money market funds, um, in a number of ways, we are invested in extractive industry in the stock market. What we attempt to do is to calculate how much of our individual investment plans are invested in projects of extraction. Our goal is to liberate this money because we believe we can't financially benefit from the destruction of the earth and indigenous peoples. The cornerstone of standard investment strategies is what is, what is called S&P 500. These are the 500 biggest companies in America, and you can buy an index fund which just invests in these. About 2.6% of index funds are invested in mining companies like Newmont Mining and Freeport McMorrin. And to my knowledge, you can't actually 
buy an index fund that doesn't have these embedded in it. But it is relatively easy to calculate how much profit one has made from just those companies. To figure out what that profit is for you, you just multiply how much money you have in the large cap index by 2.6% and then by the year to date profits. What we're working to do is to liberate that money and provide it to groups, organizations, and indigenous peoples themselves for land return and in the effort to dismantle oppressive systems. You can see the formula on our website, which is at dofdmeno.org. That's d-o-f-d-m-e-n-n-o.org. If you go there, you will also learn more about the doctrine of discovery and our movement. We are a group of Anabaptist leaders who work together to mobilize the church to dismantle the doctrine of discovery. We proclaim an Anabaptist spirit of discipleship rooted in the call to love neighbor, seeking right relationship and reconciliation through active nonviolence. To learn more about our work, please check out our podcast, Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery podcast. Also, you can find a link there on our website. It is truly a privilege to join you today. I look forward at some point to meeting each of you and to knowing you as we work together to stand up for systems of life led by the great animator, the creator, the spirit of life. Amen to that. And, um... We're so excited that Sarah Augustine will be joining us in a little while during our Q&A time. So please uh, uh, reserve your comments and questions for that point. And she will also be one of the speakers during our Just Transition Town Hall at United Women in Faith Assembly that's happening May 20th. So if you're wondering if you should join virtually or in person, please do so because she, she will be one of the speakers um, around our discussion on just transition. So our next speaker will be Nisha Guy, and um, many of you may know Nisha because she has served as our board of directors and program advisory group member for United Methodist Women. And she spent six years representing United Methodist Women, now United Women in Faith, on the board of directors of Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility. She has dialogued with the oil industry, food sector, and agriculture, addressed human rights issues, and has worked on water rights and the climate impact on water in the Great Lakes area. She's an environmental activist. And we are so excited to have her really give us some uh, context in what it means of uh, the importance and the, the way we can be involved in corporate and investor advocacy. Thank you, Nisha, for joining us today. I'm glad to be with you, Liz. Thank you for asking me. Um, Marianne, I'm gonna ask you to forward the slides if you would. Um, uh, seems like my laptop won't let me do that. Uh, being a voice at the table with companies and investors is, is not that difficult, actually. Uh, and I think that more of us can be empowered to serve in that way. I have put here just four ways uh, that we go into being in advocacy for our concerns over climate justice through work with corporations or investors. To know to make sure that we uh, understand the impact points that companies and investors have on the environmental concerns that we have in our area. So all of us might come to the table with a different concern. As Liz had mentioned, I'm very concerned here in Michigan over water concerns. Do uh, live into the touch points that you have of influencing. Be committed to say that I will follow through um, once I get grounded, I'm going to follow through with what I know, and I'm going to continue until I get the results that I need. Serve, learning to take the gifts that we have and utilize them on boards and agencies or other ways in our communities and serving to live into those touch points. And of course, to advocate, always advocate the core values that are driving our passions. So let's continue. Let's look at those four. Um, Marianne, if you could move to the next slide please. 
uh, learning how we purchase and how we impact companies from purchasing is one way we can influence companies, but we also have ways in which we corporately can affect business strategy plans and business and investments. Uh, my time with ICCR was uh, really eye-opening. I came to the table thinking, uh, what is someone from West Michigan going to be able to do to influence um, Hormel or ConocoPhillips? And I learned very quickly that understanding the mechanisms with which we can influence through our voice and our actions and our commitments to hold companies accountable is very important. So one way that we did that was making sure that companies um, had certain goals and objectives, especially environmental goals and objectives, such as ESG uh, kind of standards that we wanted them to have. We could dialogue with companies, um, holding them to those standards and concerns about ways in which they might not be holding that accountability. I remember my first time with Hormel and sitting in a room with maybe 10 or 12 people thinking, how are we going to ever influence a company like Hormel? We were there over concerns of, of the farming industries, the impacts of um, pork farming um, on the environment. And I remember thinking, I represent the voice of 800,000 at the time, United Methodist women. And of those women, a good share of them were farmers. And almost all of them were consumers and the main consumers for their family. And I knew that that held weight with a company like Hormel and it did. And we were engaged in relationship because they knew the influence of those 800,000 women. Dialogues with companies and proxy voting, those are all very important ways in which we can make our points and hold companies accountable. You can go on to the next slide, Marianne. When we do, when we actually move into that active role, we can see that our habits are a great part of conversation. We need to practice what we preach as well. And so adjusting our spending habits to align with our concerns is important. Are we purchasing the items? Are we purchasing them from the stores or the companies in which we believe um, we should be? How are they impacting the community? Because our dollar does impact just as much as our voice when working with companies. And I also say that in our local setting, knowing what's happening in your local setting is very important as well, because we can influence local companies because we live and learn together in our communities. That witness is very, very important. And the next slide, please, Marianne. Importantly, serving, find those ways in your community in which you can give your voice to the local efforts. Um, I sit on an endowment trust as an endowment trustee on the West Michigan Environmental Action Council. And that gives me a chance to share my wisdom of what I've gleaned with them and help them to impact the community in a different way through their investments. And you can do that in your churches. Your churches should be examples of how we can change and become more effective through divestment op options and our endowments that we have in our churches and also in your personal um, retirement plans or however you choose to utilize um, your, your private investing uh, to make sure that you are living into that as well, not just asking that of companies. And the last slide, I think we're getting to the last slide. Oh, one more. Um, advocating is very important. We here in Michigan have been advocating the rights um, of the little band of, of Adawa and the bottling issue with Nestle. And taking that on in collaboration with the province of Ontario in Canada, we do a lot together anyway in Michigan. So it's a natural relationship to have that with Ontario. But you can do that directly through collaboration with other organizations, um, influencing the concerns that you have. And we had here with Nestle and bottled water. We're slowly getting there. And the last slide. I just wanted to say that um, the last thing I wanted to say is there will be some resources for you at the end. I cannot highly recommend um, Interface Center for Corporate Responsibility, learning more about how our investments are made and how we can influence. So thank you for this time, Liz and everyone. Good luck to you and um, becoming empowered voices at the table. Thank you so much, Nisha, for just giving us really a 
a good sense of like how we can get involved, opportunities for engagement very concretely, and also for your leadership over the years. Uh, while at United Women in Faith, and also even now, your continuing work and engagement. Uh, so we're going to uh, transition on, and I'm going to uh, give us an opportunity to think about some of our theological uh, connections, as well as United Women in Faith, or previously United Methodist Women's work uh, that we've been engaged in around corporate engagement and advocacy. So let me know if you're able to see my slide. I know sometimes it takes a bit of time. Are you all able to see it? You are, great. Okay, and of course my computer is frozen, it seems. <laughs> um, okay, just give me a moment as I try to get this going. Okay. So I want to begin with uh, the Book of Resolutions. And many of you may know that the United Methodist Church holds social teachings within that guide us. And um, the social teachings of the church include the Book of Resolutions and the social principles that really give us a trajectory of how we can live faithfully in our world. And as part of that, in the Book of Resolutions, there is a resolution around privatization. And it notes that uh, the earth is, the earth and its fullness are the Lord's, as it says in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 26. And as Sarah Augustine was speaking about, right, uh, the way we see the economy in the world is of the values of Christians is that it is one of abundance, not of scarcity, and not held only by a few. And so it's already, you know, evoking a sense of our direction of what God is calling us to. Uh, it continues on and says corporate interests are rushing to privatize many of the resources of the earth, water, energy, education, natural plants, human animal genes, culture, and public services, and it gives examples. And it says that um, we also need strong ethical government and new laws to protect our common property as well. So there are directives in terms of how we could move as people of faith, as United Methodists, in our work of advocacy as well. So that's what it's speaking about in terms of uh, the relationship around privatization, and really not only the role of governments, but that common resources don't belong to the governments or the market, right? And that it, and when that happens, a privatization of common property, it's a form of taking from people. And that uh, bodies of international rules have been developed by corporations that really are undermining common goods and common responsibilities and what we need to do, you know, in terms of ensuring that water, energy are accessible to all. And also in terms of stewardship of God's creation, right, is being undermined when companies say, well, this is private property held by a company and we can do whatever we want, right? Though it has disproportionate harm on communities of color, on indigenous community, low wealth community and creation. So I wanted to note that, especially as we're thinking about, well, renewable energy, right? Uh, is that something that will be privatized in terms of energy access? Um, and many utility companies are privatized, right? Investor owned. And I know Christina will be speaking about more about that. What are opportunities then as we're moving towards the energy transition to deprivatize, uh, to make it more accessible as well and for there to be more accountability? Also want to uh, direct us to the social principles of the United Methodist Church, specifically the economic community. And within uh, the principles there, it says, we claim all economic systems to be under the judgment of God, no less than other facets of the created order. Therefore, we recognize the responsibility of governments to develop and implement sound fiscal and monetary policies that provide for the economic life of individuals and corporate entities and that ensure full employment adequate income with a minimum of inflation. We believe private and public 
economic enterprises are responsible for the social costs of doing business, such as employment and environmental pollution, and that they should be held accountable for these costs. Okay, so we've talked a lot about climate crisis, the causes, fossil fuel companies, who are responsible for these externalities, right? Environmental pollution as well. In the area of consumption, it says consumers should evaluate their consumption of goods and services in light of the needs for enhanced quality of life rather than unlimited production of materials. Again, what Sarah Augustine was speaking about. We call upon consumers, including local congregations, church-related institutions to organize to achieve these goals and to express dissatisfaction with harmful economic, social, or ecological practices through such appropriate methods as boycott, letter writing, corporate uh, resolutions, and advertisement. And that's why we're talking about these things today, right? How uh, can we as people of faith really engage in this work together? And corporations, we know, um, are not only responsible to their stock stakeholders and stockholders, but also to other stakeholders, workers, suppliers, vendors, customers, the communities in which they do business and for the earth, which support them. We support the public's right to know what impacts corporations have in these various arenas so that people can make informed choices about what corporations to support. Okay, so social principles, our social teachings, I really want to remind us to lean on them, to dig into them as we do our work of advocacy. The work at United Women in Faith, in terms of our engagement with companies, have been for decades. I just want to give a few examples before we move on. In 1939, various branches of the Methodist Church came together to form a single church. Now, you may remember in the 1930s, what did we have in the United States? Segregation, overt and legalized segregation. And during this time, Women's Division adopted a policy in 1941 uh, noting that they would hold its meetings only in places where all members of its group can be entertained without any form of racial discrimination. When they had their assembly, the first National Assembly in 1942, um, in St. Louis, Missouri, when they were planning to do it, Black women would be denied access to the hotels. And so as a result, did United Methodist women continue to have their event there? No. They chose to move, go to Columbus, Ohio, where there were guarantees of hotel access, right? So just noting that as a commitment, as an organization, we have taken actions around racial discrimination and to also put companies on notice that we do not stand by these components, right? And we stand for justice and this is how we will use our investment and funds. So I would say this happened years before the Montgomery boycott, <laughs> before the March on Washington, um, and years before the Civil Rights Act that banned discrimination in public accommodation. So we don't need to be thinking about, well, what are others doing? We can take the lead in this work, right? And our foremothers have done that. 1965, just fast forwarding to Filipino American grape harvesters were seeking better wages and working and housing conditions. They asked the National Farm Workers Association to help them achieve justice on the job, Church and society uh, supported a boycott and called on United Methodists to engage in that. United Methodist women con uh, with the support, uh, United Methodist congregations with the support of UMW became great free zones. And for years they were engaged in that work where there were no grapes being offered. And then it led in 1970 to the ending of that boycott where farm workers succeeded in getting better pay. Right, so that is us being in solidarity to communities directly being impacted. 1977, fast forward again, uh, United Methodist uh, this Women or Women's Division then, the directors voted unanimously that the division use only chlorine free paper. And this came because of mounting evidence of the connection between dioxin contamination caused in the paper bleaching process and various severe health problems in children and women like breast cancer. There was a massive national campaign to educate women and what happened, members went to stores, right? And asking them to no longer have paper, dioxin filled paper 
in their stores and for it not to be available. And uh, actually within three years, United Methodist Women received the International Sacred Gift to the Planet Award uh, for its education and corporate responsibility effort. And chlorine fee paper products are more widely available. And we actually had some of the headquarters from large office suppliers meeting, asking for a meeting with us, right? So just noting the work that we have done and fast forward to just a few years ago where, where we engaged in corporate advocacy and we actually partnered with Interface Center for Corporate Responsibility. And I remember speaking with Christina Herman on this saying, okay, we're having an assembly. What's the action that we can do? Christina connected us with Environmental Defense Fund. And in that process, we decided we want to have a conversation with Chevron, both as an investor, and Christina will talk more about that, but also as stakeholders in the community. And we had 20 of us who went to the headquarters, carrying over 1,700 letters, delivering it to Chevron headquarters in California, meeting with them and urging them to cut their methane. Right? We've done this with also with our Faith to Ford campaign, partnering with Interfaith Power and Light and the UCC. Uh, again, delivering letters to uh, Ford headquarters, urging them to support clean car standards. So we've done this throughout our work. And why are we saying we need to do this? Because we know companies play a huge role in um, emissions and transportation sector is the major source in the United States, electricity 25%, industry 23%, commercial residents and then ag. So there's a huge role to play here in terms of changing um, the, you know, impacting industries and different sectors and companies to move towards emissions reductions, drastic reductions in emissions. So I'm gonna now hand it over actually to Christina uh, to share more about what is going on um, in the corporate context and how we as United Methodist Women, United Women of Faith can be involved. And um, just to let you know that Christina is the program director for climate change and environmental justice at Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility. And it is now celebrating its 50th anniversary and United Methodist Women was one of the nine founders of the organization. So I think about our foremothers who really invested in this work. And so we're continuing that work. A little bit about Christina. Christina has 28 years of experience with non-governmental and faith-based advocacy organizations working on human rights and sustainable development issues. She manages a small climate team that works with ICCR members to promote corporate climate commitments to hold global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius while ensuring a just transition for communities and workers. Christina, we're so grateful to have you here with us today. Uh, thank you, and thank you for being such a leader in um, gathering uh, faith communities to be involved in this work. Well, thanks so much, uh, Liz. I, it's it's a real pleasure to be here, and it was wonderful to hear the social policy that um, has been adopted and that is driving your work. Um, a lot of it sounded, it was music to my ears because it's it's what I think inspires that kind of thinking is what inspires, um, you know, members of ICCR as we, uh, as we engage companies. So I, I don't have slides. Um, I apologize for that. I, um, it's been a very, very busy proxy season. And when I start telling you about what's uh, on, uh, on our plates these days, you'll, you'll, um, you'll commiserate. Um, anyway, ICCR is a, a coalition and uh, Nakia teed it up well. Um, we're a coalition of about 300 faith and values-based institutional investors who, and we actively engage companies in uh, our portfolios. Uh, we see that work is, and, the, and our, I think our members see their ownership as a powerful catalyst for change. Our mission statement is inspired by faith, committed to action. Um, it really sets forth our pledge to be active owners, to engage meaningfully with the companies in our portfolios through this process of shareholder engagement that we pioneered, you know, 50 years ago. Our model of engaging companies as a group of investors has been emulated by other investor networks like the UN Principles for Responsible Investment and the Climate Action 100 Plus, which is a very large initiative um, to engage the heaviest emitters um, in the world. So, 
Um, our guiding principle as shareholders is that sustainable corporations must look beyond the next earnings report to account for the full impact of their business on society and must view the well being of all their stakeholders, including their workers and the communities where they operate, as integral to their long term value. So I think that um, I think this has been been talking, you know, the importance of companies not just existing for the purpose of making profit, but they, they have a social function. Um, and we're trying to, I think, to draw them back more uh, toward that original, um, you know, sort of um, reason for being. So ICCR has been at the vanguard of the share, shareholder advocacy movement and both the issues we bring to corporations and the strategies we employ to hold them accountable. So what motivates us to lead uh, in this way is our connections to the communities most impacted by corporate practices and the clear evidence of progress made because of our interventions. I think, you know, those church connections at the local level often uh, drive our engagement. So we have a couple of new engagements with um, energy uh, utilities that have been, uh, we, we picked up and, you know, and started engagements with those companies because local church members have come to our members and said, you know, this is going on or we're experiencing this problem or we're seeing this and, and we would, um, you know, we would like you to consider um, talking to the to the company about it. And if that fits in with a campaign that we're running, um, we're, you know, we often do that. Um, so, you know, as I said, our membership, as I mentioned, it consists of a broad range of organizations, both religious and secular. Um, but our members make common cause through our this persistent focus on social and environmental justice and our collective commitment to bring these concerns to companies through direct collaborative engagement, which can often include, um, you know, well, local stakeholders. Um, a little bit about the climate crisis. I mean, companies as well as households have been embedded in a carbon-based energy economy since the industrial revolution. We're now in a second energy revolution toward an economy powered by energy produced by renewable sources, wind, solar, geothermal, to a lesser extent hydro, which uh, you know, is, is sustainable, but carries problems because of some of its environmental and social impacts, especially large hydro. Um, but this transformation of the energy economy naturally poses a threat to the oil and gas industry, to traditional energy producers, coal, oil and gas producers, and the ecosystem of fossil fuel support industries. This is, you know, a huge transition that we're undergoing. Um, and it's necessary because the threat posed by the climate crisis itself to company operations and supply chains, not to mention communities, um, is making the transition to renewable energy um, a compelling choice. I mean, we must make this transition if we're going to survive on this planet, quite bluntly. Um, and there's there's some encouraging news. I mean, it it's a very complicated, uh, difficult, and will remain difficult, I think, transition because of the upheaval it's going to bring about and the pace at which we have to operate. But um, there are a lot of companies, more than 2,500 businesses and financial institutions, for instance, are working with the Science-Based Targets Initiative to reduce their emissions in line with climate science. So more than 1,200 companies have set targets aligned with a 1.5 degree centigrade future, which given the delay in addressing the climate crisis by governments and corporations is going to be exceedingly difficult to achieve. But this is an important movement. Companies have felt pressure from long-term investors like ours that hold companies across the market, we're called universal owners, they felt pressure to decarbonize quickly and with regard to the impacts of the transition on the most vulnerable. And I think this is a place where the church, the churches and the values-based investors in our network are particularly important because they um, continually drive home that message. So ICCR and our members have been working to ensure that the energy transition is a just one. 
A just transition framework pairs necessary climate action with commitments to labor standards, human rights, and inclusive growth, and centers the workers and communities who contribute to and are affected by the transition. In February of this year, an ICCR-led coalition of investors representing nearly $4.3 trillion released a statement of investor expectations for job standards and community impacts in the just transition. And that urges companies and investors to take five key steps. And I'm going to put uh, a link to it in the chat so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, First is provide a foundation for decent work. Two, offer equitable opportunities for quality jobs. Three, invest in, invest in impacted communities. Four, facilitate transparency and accountability. And five, support just transition policies at the federal, state, and local levels. And that policy support is really critical. Um, and it's something that we need to make sure happens very soon. I just want to call out Jake Barnett at Westpath, um, the Methodist Pension Fund, um, for his work on in helping to develop this statement. And, you know, we're grateful for Westpath's leadership, really, in charting the way forward um, through the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance. This is asset owners, you know, really working to move the investor ecosystem and by extension, the companies they invest in toward a decarbonized and more equitable economy. Um, I mean, we're just one part of the overall, you know, economic ecosystem, but this, you know, I really feel strongly that this work of engaging companies with a values framework is, is critical. Um, so I wanna say just a little bit about our sector work on Just Transition. We mentioned it, it's focused on the energy utility sector because it accounts for, about 25% of emissions in the United States. And as these companies move toward a decarbonized electricity grid and gas supply, we're urging them to make that transition a just one. So this is particularly important as coal plants are closed. So workers in these plants, which are generally unionized, are often offered other jobs in the company or early retirement, but they can still face uncertainty and dislocation. Communities, on the other hand, are often left with a severely reduced tax base, which affects their ability to pay for teachers, firefighters, and police once a coal plant closes. They can also face higher electricity rates to pay for that early closure of these coal plants. Um, and so there's some mechanisms that are, can be put in place if the utilities um, choose to advocate for those um, that can spread that burden. And, and we're in discussions with them about how to um, how to engage stakeholders and think about the the impact of their um, their decisions on on both of course on workers and on on communities. Um, justice is also very important in pursuing the build out of the new energy economy. So we're in conversations with two utilities in New England that are exploring networked geothermal as an alternative to building, heating, and cooling, which has been powered by gas systems up to now. Um, and we're working with both community groups and local labor to ensure that the current gas workers are not left behind because the, uh, the worry is that those jobs uh, are gonna be filled by contract laborers because the geothermal companies are not necessarily unionized, just the way the solar installers are not, um, you know, necessarily um, hiring unionized labor. So there's, there's a real conversation to be had about how to raise uh, job standards. And that's why we've developed the, the investor expectations to, you know, signal to companies um, that there's a lot of investor concern, you know, we invest in these companies, and this is um, an important um, expectation, we want them to start wrapping into their own corporate policies, um, higher, you know, call, calls for high job standards for local hire for uh, prevailing wages, um, if not outright unionization. So because, and, you know, we have a really good business case to make, because we always make the business case as well as the moral case. If you, um, if you build out the new energy economy with, you know, contract 
labor that is, I mean, it's perfectly, you know, fine people and they need jobs, but it's, they don't have a lot of protections. They don't necessarily have pension plans themselves. The unions can organize even for construction workers who are working, you know, uh, not steady jobs. They've got, you know, a job here, job, 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 you know, they're all separate. They have a centralized pension fund that they and their employers uh, continue to pay into. So, you know, there are a lot of protections that come with unionization that are really important. Um, and if, you know, shifting from an energy economy that's largely unionized and has decent jobs for, you know, good middle-class jobs to one that is, you know, jobs are coming in at $15 an hour, you're gonna get a lot of resistance to that kind of change and rightly so. Um, and so, the transition becomes a threat to workers rather than opportunity and potentially a powerful drag on the pace of the transition, which is gonna affect everybody. Um, and we can't afford to slow anything down. So um, it can also mean a lack of economic opportunity for the local economy, because you know that local hire is really important. So I'm getting into the weeds a little bit here, but that's sort of where we live in these conversations. Um, and, and I think that's really where the rubber hits the road in making um, this the transition truly a, a just and equitable one. Um, one other point that I'll, I won't dwell on, but I think is really important is uh, opening up training programs to low income um, and communities of color that have been left out of traditionally of the trades unions um, that, you know, there's an opportunity to enhance equity as we make the transition as well. And people are really working on that at the, the, the local level, the state level, particularly. Um, and then finally, just, you know, I think, um, I think it might've been Liz who was talking about this problem of the energy utilities wanting to control the build out um, it's really important and we're pushing for uh, there to be a, an inclusive stakeholder engagement process because um, there is, a, I mean, we're members, of, we have solar on our roof here in Washington, DC, which is where I'm based. Um, and I'm part of a local so solar co-op. Co There's been a lot of build out of solar and, and it's a, you know, the utilities see it as a threat to their um, to their business model. So we need to take that seriously, but you know, figure out a way forward that we need all of the above. We need rooftop solar and we need it to be put in equitably. And um, anyway, there's a big conversation out there, out there about the energy transition, but um, that's part of a lot of what we've been doing lately. Um, so I've talked a lot and I'm trying to think, you know, really how to. I think, you know, I was struck in the poll by the number of people who make decisions about uh, your purchasing based on, um, you know, social, you know, equity considerations or, or sustainability considerations. And that social activism is really important because companies are quite sensitive to that, particularly the brands. Um, I mean, there are a couple things that I think are important for companies to hear from people that they need to prioritize capital expenditures for that transition to renewable energy. Because it, it often involves buying new equipment, you know, refrigeration equipment, for instance, or vehicle fleets, and that's expensive. But we need that to happen. Um, and the, you know, so the temptation on their part can be to delay the pace of change, even as the crisis worsens. So hearing from networks like yours is really important on that. Um, and for people, all of us to talk to everybody we know about the importance of speeding up this, the pace of change, because we can do it. We just need to move a lot faster. The other important need for companies is to spend a different kind of capital political capital and prioritize science-based climate lobbying. So we have a big campaign on Paris Align climate lobbying and trying to get, you know, talking to companies about um, disclosing, um, but also really aligning their lobbying and their trade association membership with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So that, you know, we, we typically, when we talk to companies about cutting greenhouse gas emissions, we also talk to them about what are you doing to support, you know, to um, 
generate support for the policies that are needed to um, help you reach your goals faster. Um, so um, yeah, we've been, I think there's gonna be some climate policy coming up um, in the spring that'll be really important for, for companies to hear from everybody that they, this is something they need to support. Um, so I'm almost finished. I, I was asked to talk a little bit about the season our members filed over 460 resolutions with companies this year. <laughs> it's really a lot. 130 of one of those were climate related proposals. Um, and, you know, this filing of a resolution is by, you know, for voting on by other shareholders is a way for investors to raise concerns regarding a governance or a significant policy issue with companies. It's not something typically you would do. Um, as a, you know, you, you may own stock directly in a company, you're probably not going to file a shareholder resolution, although you could, and there's certain rules how to do it. But um, we do this a lot. And we also engage companies in dialogue, and we don't have to file resolutions to do that. Um, but, you know, the resolution process is really an important signal in this whole system that we're operating in. If other investors vote in large numbers for a proposal, management will take the issue seriously. If they don't, investors can respond by escalating and voting against board members that they see are not holding management accountable to shareholder concerns. And that happened, you know, there um, was a takeover basically of the Exxon Mobil board, or at least there three people got ousted and, and replaced by climate friendly um, uh, board members. So this whole engagement is can have significant impacts on companies. Um, that particular campaign uh, costs mm, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 or 30 million dollars. So that's not something we typically engage in, but we were very happy to see it happen. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about the resolution process because it's uh, it, it has rules that are, it's governed by the SEC rules. Um, and we filed proposals on for many, many years on a host of issues from labor protections to access to affordable medicines, um, respect for human rights, a wide variety of environmental concerns. Our um, in the in the climate space um, this year, we, we have a number of sort of clusters. There are a lot that are focused um, on GHG emissions reductions. Um, I don't have the, I have the totals here somewhere, but it's, you know, I mean, we continue to try to reduce demand for fossil fuels. Um, we also filed, I think 20, almost 30 proposals on Paris aligned climate lobbying to try to get that policy alignment that we need. Um, there were several interesting proposals filed on just transition. And I think we're gonna see a lot more of that next year. Um, and we had three on direct measurement of methane. I just have to mention Chevron because I know you signed, you sent in all those petitions and someone from the company said to me, you can tell the United Methodist women, because that's what you were called then, they, they don't need to send in paper petitions. They, they can do it online. And I'm like, she said, I have a whole stack of paper in the corner of my office and I, I can't throw it out. I feel like I shouldn't throw it out but I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> I thought, good, it's a reminder. It's a re constant daily reminder of the importance of those concerns and the issues. And I just have to say, Chevron, this is the first time this has ever happened with the US oil major. They are supporting our shareholder proposal on methane this year. And I think you guys should all just give yourselves a big round of applause because that is, it's quite extraordinary. The proposal was calling on them to, I mean, we have to ask for reports on things, but it really make, it gets the company to do something. It's on direct measurement. So really doing much more direct measurement of methane emissions um, to which, um, because the estimates, the way they report their methane emissions now is not terribly accurate. It's an EPA formula, it's an engineering formula. Um, well-meaning, but everybody knows it's got a lot of problems. And so this business of 
focusing on direct measurement is really critical. And it's, you know, I mean, when you get the company saying vote for this proposal, you get a 98 or a 99% approval rate. And, you know, so it's, it was just a great signal. I, I just wanted to share that with you. Um, one final, uh, I think probably the, the thing that I've been busiest with this year, and uh, I'm on, I'll just finish with this, um, is we filed a raft of proposals with the banks and insurance companies. So all the major banks in the US and Canada um, calling resolutions, calling for um, banks to start figuring out how to stop financing for new fossil fuel development. It's a critically important move. I don't know that they're going to get terribly high votes, but I was told yesterday it's already started a really significant conversation in the sector among banks and you know the insurance companies. Um, so I, you know, just great work and it's, it's a lot of fun to be part of it. If you're an investor, we invite you to read the proposals listed in our 2022 proxy, proxy resolutions and voting guide. And I'll put a link to that in the chat in a minute. If you have get proxies directly from a company, you know, look through, you can sort of check through the list in the proxy guide, find out if there's a proxy, um, you know, filed with that company. Um, vote for, uh, you know, the, the policy, the uh, resolutions that are calling for, you know, action on climate or racial equity or, you know, any one of a number of issues. It's probably one of our members that have filed it. Um, so, um, yeah, vote your proxies. Um, there were a whole slew of racial justice pro proposals filed this year, um, 73, you know, eight focused specifically on environmental and racial justice. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of activity and I'll, I hope you can learn more just by, by reading it, but it's, it's, uh, it's great work and we rely really on, um, on organizations like yours to be pushing um, and, and moving um, the conversation, I think really, you know, opening up that space and we, we're all needed in this, in this transition and this great effort to try to save the planet, honestly. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Christina, and uh, just so much work that is happening. And as I hope you all are sensing, there's inside game that's happening internally, right? In terms of the shareholder investor, dialogue, proxy process, et cetera. Uh, and then there's outside game happening, stakeholders. But I just, again, like what is our vision? Right, Sarah uh, shared with us in terms of what is our vision in terms of the world that we see. And as uh, United Women of Faith and as part of the United Methodist Church, our responsibility in the acts of repentance and justice with indigenous communities, right, on Turtle Island as well. So just, I wanted to hold that. Also wanted to note that um, in terms of the just transition, right, there's workers are important communities, the cost of electricity, but also the externalities that communities have already, front fence line communities have borne in their bodies of their health and accountability for the companies to clean it up and women needing to be part of that, the green jobs, right? Economy of the energy economy because women are uh, less than quarter in some of the energy sectors, right? In terms of jobs. So how is that gonna be a gender justice component for a living wage as well? Um, I wanted to open it up. I know there's been some comments in there and not as many questions. Uh, there was one of, around uh, USPS and postal trucks uh, that they are going, you know, they're still trying to purchase or plans to purchase diesel run, highly problematic. So we do need to do advocacy and speak with our legislators on that so that USPS will not continue in that. So problematic and we need greater investments. But I wanted to actually begin, um, we don't have much time, but maybe one question I have for all of the uh, panelists is, and maybe because I was Sarah, because Sarah joined us. Hello, Sarah, welcome. <laughs> How do we avoid and hold companies accountable and get them, uh, you know, because there's so much greenwashing essentially that's happening, right? So what do we need to be on the lookout for and how do we stop that? And like, what can we do? So Sarah and then uh, Nisha and then Christina. It's something that's really important um, in our working work together with Indigenous peoples is that um, we work to have face-to-face -face negotiation directly between companies and the Indigenous peoples 
that are bearing the brunt of emissions. So rather than saying, hey, we're going to work this out in a boardroom, we really advocate for direct person to person negotiation. So we can use the power that we have to get those voices and faces directly in negotiation where they're, um, they're advocating for their own interests. So that's something that's really important. It's something that we do directly with mining companies frequently. It can be uncomfortable. It is totally worth it when you see um, indigenous communities advocating for themselves. I would agree with Sarah. I, I think um, approaching companies locally makes a big impact as well and being in relationship with them on an ongoing basis. And because we're such a large network of women, we can do that. And that constant relationship uh, really proves very productive when you are dealing with specific issues and holding companies accountable at the at the base level. So it's, you know, the companies aren't just in New York and LA, right? They are all over this country and we can influence them at that level. Yeah, I would say um, what banks, your local banks, ask people, ask them what they're doing in terms of assessing their own climate risk. They'll say they don't have any, but they sure do because they may be, depending on who they're lending to or, you know, just, I mean, everybody's facing climate risk at this point. And so, you know, thinking about local companies. Um, but I, I think for us, um, we do a combination of benchmarking. And so there are, like, we're part of the World Benchmarking Alliance and they're benchmarking companies on a whole array of indicators related to just transition or the transition itself. There's the transition pathway initiative. There, there are all these different benchmarks we have out there. So we can sort of gauge where companies are. But for us, we think it's so important to have information from local communities about what the company's really doing, because they can say they can say anything they want. Well, they don't say anything they want to. That I won't go that far, but it's not fair. But they can they can massage what they're saying and uh, it can obscure a lot that's actually going on. So I think that, you know, that kind of flow of reality into um, our work and then, you know, raising that with them and, and, and saying, how are you dealing with this? This is an issue. This is a problem. And, you know, what policies do you have in place and, and what, you know, are you aware of it? Because sometimes they aren't. So. Thank you. So talking about it, profiling it, Sarah, as you were saying, whose voice is at the table and don't do it behind closed doors, right? Publicly uh, have those conversations. Uh, and I think that relates to a question that came in. Do you include support for local independent media in your action plan? Christina, as you said, we rely on independent media a lot. And so I think one of the questions that relates to that is what is the role that women of faith can play in that process, right? Because sometimes it becomes so niche um, or talked about only in certain spaces. So I, I agree that in our work, we depend on independent media quite a lot too. And I think one of the things that, that women of faith can do at the grassroots level is to support the work that's ongoing and so I think what I mean by that is providing opportunity to be part of networks that are doing the work, tracking the work, sharing the work with the people in your community, sharing information. I mean, in, in terms of what we do with the coalition, Dismantling Doctrine of Discovery Coalition, when we have, you know, the, the, the campaigns we have going, it's possible for any person to directly become involved in a campaign. And so knowing what's going on, sharing what's going on, and um, being part of it, I mean, so much of what we can do now is also on social media. So, and I don't wanna lift up with social media because it's problematic too, but we can share out information at a rate that we've never been able to do it before. And just being connected, you, you cannot believe how inspiring that is. We're working with a Mayan community right now that's dealing with um, the impacts of Monsanto on their traditional territories. And we have a network um, through North America and to Europe. And the, 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 the bolstered confidence that communities on the ground have just because they're in relationship with, um, with women across um, multiple continents is extraordinary. And the amount of resources that come in because of that network, and I don't just mean money, I also mean talent, effort, networks, access, 
you know, being engaged is, I, I just wanted to shout it out and say that is the spirit of life. That is a demonstration of the spirit of God among us. Thank you. And I'm mindful of time now. Um, and I'm hearing, don't do it alone, do it in community, prioritize those impacted um, and be that amplifier, right? And that resource and be involved. Uh, any last brief sentence as we close our tie? Liz, I would just say that, um, you know, we can be the instruments of change. Sometimes we think we can't. We're just a local woman, but we can. Um, we're consumers, we're advocates, we're investors at some capacity as committed women of faith. And, and I think we just need to choose to discover the ways to live into that. Um, these opportunities are life-changing. I just want to um, amplify that word and say, you are the right people. You are here, you're alive now. You're the representatives of your ancestors and you are also the, the representatives of the ones that come after you. You are absolutely the right people um, and you are qualified. Yeah, I remember a, a line from, you know, I, I worked with the Mennonite Central Committee in the Philippines 35 year plus years ago. And, and I remember people talking about the importance of speaking truth to power. That has not gone away. That is so important. And, and doing it with some measure of humility as well, I think. But, you know, the, the collaborative working is so important because that's what keeps us and is going to continue to keep us going throughout all this. So thanks. Thanks for your network. Amen. Amen. Thank you for those words. Uh, just really deeply energizing. Uh, we're going to close with Emmy Liu, who will be uh, leading us in closing prayer, and then we'll have just some announcements. Emmy Liu, uh, John says that the joy of serving on various leadership levels of United Women in Faith continues to be the friendships made and the actions taken to make a better and more just world while working on issues from the law of the sea to just energy for all. She served as treasurer, vice president, and archivist for the World Federation of Methodist and Uniting, a United Church Women as well. So Emmy Liu, thanks for closing us in prayer during our after our time of discussion. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be with you. So let us be in prayer. Dear gracious and loving creator, we come to you with thankful but also heavy hearts. We praise you for the gifts that you have given each of us to make us using to make us have a kinder, more just, and more livable world. We so appreciate our presenters today, Sarah, Nisha, Christina, and Liz, for their passion and the willingness to share such important and helpful information. Be with us as we continue to explore what we, people of faith, can do to press corporations and governments to address the climate crisis while advocating for just energy solutions in our home communities and around the world. We thank you for the staff that brings us together and encourages us into action. We also come to you with troubled and heavy hearts for what is happening in this world. We haven't learned to share and put aside our inclinations of greed. Help us to share our concerns with our governmental leaders so that they will make more just and peaceful decisions regarding our Ukrainian and Russian siblings. We remember that peacemakers will be called the children of God. Help each of us to answer that call, to be your child. We gathered today to learn and discuss difficult and important energy and climate challenges. Please make us mindful of the gift of waking up tomorrow morning with your grace surrounding us and our abilities to share that grace with others. We pray all of this in the name of the one who has shown us the path that our life's journey must take as we put faith, hope, and love into action. Amen.